All right. Um, welcome to a, another painting tutorial. This is Andrew Broussard. Um, I think it is Thursday. Days are blending together a little bit. It is 9 a.m. So just um, I woke up, took my medicine, um, like my allergy medicine and all that. Yesterday was the first day I was allowed to um, bring home my allergy shots and administer them at home, which was really cool. Like the um, allergy medicine and the allergy shots have really been working and really been paying off and helping me out. So, um, so that's cool, but I think with the allergy shots it was just um, being consistent with them. I, th I think some people do get results, some people don't, but for me, I made sure that every week I was going to get them. And um, you know, even if I had to you know, take, a, take a half day or have somebody cover something for me or something like that just so I could get the shots. So that's cool. Um, I just wet the paper, I'm going to let it soak and absorb the water while I talk about the palette and whatnot. Um, yesterday, I, two days ago I did a ink drawing based off of, um, I have the, it's just the three part name so I have a hard time remembering the order, uh, off of Jasper Francis Cropsey's um, painting, Autumn on the Susquehanna, which was from 1859. So I did an ink drawing of it two days ago, kind of just studying it, and um, you know, it forced me to really look at that painting for an hour and a half, and kind of really um, you know, put things together with it. If you look on um, YouTube, you'll see the time lapse of that in the process. Yesterday, I had sat down here and started filming a painting where I thought, you know, I'm going to try to try to paint it in watercolor and it just wasn't going the direction that I had wanted but I subsequently you know eventually gave up and um, erased all footage <laughs> of that um, effort and I don't know if it was you know time of day me being tired um, or what you know but ultimately, I think that, and I'm not saying this to like humble myself or anything like that. He, he was a Hudson River Valley painter, which was, um, you know, they were, they, were, they were realists. They were just such amazing, detailed painters. The amount of time that they spent on a painting was... I guess just like phenomenal it's just um, the exact opposite direction that I go in and um, I'm thinking that I might have just had too high hopes and expectations going into it with um, watercolor or like I, I knew that I was getting myself into something a lot deeper than you know I have in the past and the two things just um just didn't work out, unfortunately. My, um, I, I, put, I put the paper on the side, and I think that I will eventually, maybe I will come back to it. That's something that I genuinely, like, never do, is go back to a painting. But I did put that one on the side, um, out of, you know, respect to, um, such a great artist. Um, and he had produced massive amounts of work. And... Maybe I'll um, do it in my my own style, continuing from the way it is. Anywho, um, I encourage you to go back and look at that um, time lapse of the drawing. I also um, encourage you to look up, um, and I'll, I'll put the name right here, Jasper Francis Cropsey, and you'll see just how an amazing painter he was. That's one thing I've, I've thought about was the amount of time that, um, and it was oil paint as well, so 
there is a lot of issues between the two, at least I feel like trying to translate one to another. And I think it was, um, would you say Turner was the one that kind of bridged the gap between watercolor and oil. He made oil look like watercolor. not the other thing that um, struck my mind is I remember reading something about Thomas Cole he was a Hudson River Valley painter he was alive during the same time as Jasper Francis Cropsey the same school of um, art the same um, movement and Thomas Cole I remember reading one thing where I guess they had an art show and he kind of set up camp at the art show for like five days and or ten days and did like five paintings and like was he was like I was so inspired I did all these paintings and um, and then I think if that's a lot in that time period then how much time did they genuinely spend on a painting and then you also think the availability of supplies and whatnot in the um, early 1800s they um, Windsor and Newton I believe came, came out with uh, the tubed oil paints and you know people started painting outdoors and the oils more and more and whatnot um, and where was I going with that thought? I'm not sure. All right, so the paper is soaked and saturated. Um, I think I am going to do something based off of what I learned from um, Mr. Cropsey. And that was these broad expanses, um, a central focus of light um, I think it's going to be more of an autumn scene. So it's going to be loosely based around like the ideas of what he had. And I'm going to try to talk about him. And I'm also going to deal a lot with um, uh, tonal shifts and drawing shifts that take place. So um, we're going to discuss those as we do that. Okay. So... I'm going to do a sky kind of based off of his. I have a little dab of quinacridone um, gold that I put down. I don't know if I'm going to wind up using it. I had used it a little bit last night. And I feel like that paint has such a rich vibrancy to it that maybe that would help emulate an oil painting. But um, I'm not sure if I'll wind up using it. So. This is just a light wash of raw sienna. So this is kind of the sky. And I'm just gonna push paint around and kind of get a little idea. I'm gonna be very, very um, light with the washes for this. Oh, and when I lost my train of thought, I think I was talking about um, the availability of pigments and paints, how they started coming out in tube form in the 1800s. But I'm wondering how much canvas and all that had to cost. Must have been, um, you know, a big factor in it. It seemed like a lot of painters, well, some of them, like... I don't know if they were um, paid to be on different boards working for um, different schools or institutions. But I think some of them had second jobs with the art where, oh, that is way too much. I think there was one portrait painter during that time period who was a master um, engraver. So he'd also engrave as well. 
This is just uh, playing back and forth with the Ultramarine and um, Rossiana. I'm really not trying to use that much of it. One thing that I did notice from his painting was the top right and left, and I'll have to look at his other paintings, had a slightly darker tone than the rest of the sky. And I'm not sure if that was meant to um, as a framing device or to bring um, the eye towards the center or to create an arch in the sky. That's um, one of the cats, which is uh, kind of creepy how they can make that sound. Okay, so a little bit darker, a little bit lighter wash. Let me mix this with the yellow ochre, I'm um, sorry, raw sienna. Right down a little bit. Those corners going. I'm also going to try to emulate um, some clouds that I had seen in this picture. And to get that, this is just the same mix, just a little bit more concentrated. And they seem to uh, gravitate towards the center. And then another thing I'd noticed that there was like clouds right in this area that were highlighted that um, I think would have been, you know, a white oil paint or scumbled on or something like that. So um, I'm going to emulate that with lifting. And since I'm making this my own painting and I'm kind of just from memory thinking about like what I learned from his sky, I don't think he had these um, horizon type clouds, but I'm going to put them in there. So I'm going to lift a little bit with the paper towel to try to emulate painting with um, white paint and that gives it there one thing that I noticed when I was removing um, my attempt from yesterday off of here and you know putting it on the side was the granulation in the sky and that happens with um, ultramarine because pretty much all we used was ultramarine and raw sienna just now and the same thing's going to take place and ultramarine just granulates and I've been wondering how that affects skies. It adds an interesting texture to the sky and if you do a painting using only um, ultramarine and two or three other paint uh, colors you know the granulation shows all throughout. It adds a texture but then um, I wonder really how it affects recession and whatnot, um, having that texture. Anyhow, maybe that's something to do um, two different paintings of. So, um, I think I'm going to follow what I remember up until a horizon point and then kind of play with the rest of it myself and just make it my own painting. Um, because these things I thought led to having a broad expanse and whatnot. This is, um, ultramarine and burnt umber in this mix, but I think I'm going to grab that Venetian red, that light red, make it a little bit more purpley.
And in the painting that I tried yesterday, I did wet and wet for this. I'm going to do the same thing. And um, I've kind of been quite reluctant to do it, but let's see. It, in wet and wet. Like a far distant hill. Which being wet and wet, we're not going to get crisp lines with it. And obviously in oil, it was not put in where it would disperse. But the dispersion may actually lend to this piece giving it that softness or that glow of um, that kind of sunset or sunrise taking place. Just varying the line. And I noticed within it, he had, I think I poured burnt sienna on my burnt umber. If you ever pour something on the wrong spot of your um, palette and is it yeah you can see you can scoop the card and just move it to another spot or you can wipe it completely with a um, paper towel anyway moving that over right there grab a little bit I'm going to feed a little bit into here. And then there's a pretty strong second layer of um, this is raw sienna with some of that um, burnt sienna mixed in. Now, reflection-wise, because there was water down here, this guy get, did give a reflection. And it was hidden behind um, other trees and whatnot, but like delving in and looking deep, you could kind of see some of that reflection taking place. A little bit of blue in there. But these guys didn't have a reflection. And I'm wondering if that's due to the angle. And I'm also wondering, since this was warmed up compared to here, if this was an extenuation or a curvature coming close. It was um, kind of an interesting dilemma. Now... I want pretty much paints gray. I'll go dark right along this edge. And that seemed to have, and there's a little fuzzy. I keep on catching fuzzies. I'm not sure where they're coming from. And they get the fuzzy out without ruining. Here's one thing and I'm doing it inadvertently. It wasn't in this painting, but I noticed like a lot of the landscape painters had that white line going across at the far edge of um, water. And visually, I'm not sure what causes that, but I'm gonna let that come in. That effect. Okay. Now, the, this will be the last thing that gets um, carried over. There were these very soft trees 
that were very barely noticeable due to what was being laid over over them. But there was this effect here, and it was a um, kind of receding shoreline. So I'm gonna put a little soft. Now that's super light. So I'm gonna make a, make it a little bit stronger because of that, um, that shift that'll take place. Okay, so that right here is all for um, like far distance, all of this. Now I'm gonna put in my own foreground for this. My rules for the foreground, and I'm gonna switch things up and change it, you know, make it my own painting. But carrying over from what I learned from him is that the trees themselves were very dark. The trunks, dark. But some of them had um, quite big um, tonal shifts and were almost um, raw sienna. And it was due to the catching of light. There was also central masses of these tree clusters that were super dark. And then around the edge, they went to that um, golden light from the shining of the uh, light behind, which was something that I had seen in um, the Thomas Moran's painting when I had looked at that. So it seemed like a very common approach. Also, um, they were they were realist. They were so um, textured with theirs. We're not going to use that. We're going to use the Hake. I may open up a uh, fan brush and just experiment with that as well in this painting, but um, we're not going to get that strict. Now, I do want an element, a foreground extreme element, so let me kind of put this composition together, this part. Here's raw sienna, uh, burnt sienna. bring this across. Now, he had a curve coming from this direction. I'm switching that up and the curve extended onto a, a jet of land and then there was interspersed breaks. I am going to jut this out. All the way to about here. And we'll put our um, tree structures throughout. And that right there um, separates us completely from the um, composition that we we're talking about. And then lets us go in our own direction. Within, so as I refer to stuff, it's now just um, his approach from what I remember at different um, depths into the painting as opposed to what he actually did. So this side, um, he had a lot of planes taking place on um, land masses that were closer where there was varying tones and whatnot. For instance, let me grab some Payne's Gray to really darken this up to show you. Right here on this inside, it would have been super dark. And this is the side that's catching the least amount of light. With the rigger, grab some raw sienna. We could have a flat plane back here that was catching it. So there's a lot of variation in the mid-ground um, planes. And his lines were, of course, a lot sharper. He wasn't wet and wet. In fact, I could even let 
parts of this land recede into the painting itself. Now here, I'm going to bring forward a landmass, and I'm going to wind up having to bring down its reflection in the water. However, his refre reflections weren't super, super strong. Like there was, don't get me wrong, there was dark spots without a doubt. But there was also um, not as much reflections as you would have thought. And I think it was the, um, I think the word might be scintillating. Uh, light on the water. It was just a lot of lines and um, the only way I could think of for that would be dry brushing or to sit here and meticulously put each one of those lines in which is something that I don't want to do. Because the thing that hit me was as I look at these past masters I can learn from them but you know and I can do the drawings of their stuff but I don't have to emulate them. I can learn, carry over what I learned, and still maintain my own style. And um, like I said, I, I got uh, a little you know, frustrated and disappointed with the one last night. But that seems to be the most important thing is that we, um, we learn, we see what's happening, and then we carry it over into what our world and what we do. One thing I really enjoyed was um, some of these reds that he had in the foreground. This is more dark paint on it right now. So we'll do a little bit of variety. I'll put some reds over it. We can think about where our trees are gonna be. I'm gonna put little dots. And the reason I'm doing that, I'll explain in a second. So, yeah, the reason I did that is so that I can put the reflections in now while it's wet and wet and kind of get an idea of the type of trees I want to put in. Like here, I'll put a broad mass below. Here, will probably be a tall skinny. And here might be a two-part tree. So I'm just putting those reflections in right now. And honestly, I could be perfectly fine just leaving at that amount because that's the way I, you know I do my shadows. I can, um, like I said, he had a lot of reds and all that in the water. I could put some in there. I think that might have been from the reflections of the trees in autumn to give that feel. So I could pop some of those in there while I have it on. But I could leave a lot of this paper blank. Some of it he did put blues in. Did I just drop something on here? No, I don't think so. Like here's a little light ultramarine. Just put that a little bit in, a little bit of clean water. I think some of you guys might be watching that and thinking you prefer just the white right there. And I think uh, I would agree. So we can lift that, leave a little bit of blue lift right here because we're gonna have a light source come down. In fact, it's gonna lighten up right here too. And rather than doing the light source, I could do the water on either side of it.
it's just a dark mix more ultramarine than anything just to really highlight the aspect that we have that darkness there um, we could add textures and whatnot but we're about to go into the stage of um, drying and putting those trees in um, mixing a dark this kind of talks about the different planes that I had seen within it so this is kind of the shadow aspect of some of the trees so this is the underbrush we can put that in wet and wet which add an interesting element to it parts back here that don't catch it one thing I do want to do is plant out the trees wet and wet so that they have a softness and then they're going to have a um, more textured portion over it. So we're going to have to go this soft with the trees, I think, which is going to be kind of a change of pace for me. Guys like these trees hanging lower down, so we're adding variety in the height from left to right. And this one is going to emulate more of what I saw in him where it just branches out. It catches that light. Most of this area is dry up here, actually. Okay, so let's do a dry off even though it doesn't really seem to be too necessary but right in here with the trunks I want them to be crisp okay, if you have earbuds on you want to take them off now Okay, so I'm, I'm going to rely on the rigor for um, these tree trunks. And what I think was important in order to give the grand big masses or the, the grandiose scheme is first of all this far, far uh, mountain range or tree lines or anything like that. Second was in this level of the painting, just the... Um, the thinness of the trees themselves. I could change the um, the thickness of them. A squatter tree or stouter tree one thing that I really liked was he would have these branches that came out and up like these main structures and they'd start to weep. But then on the other side, you would have branches that went up to do all this bigger support structure.
I have to darken these quite a bit as they're backlit. These guys sit in place. Now you see this dark that's going down. Um, I think this level of darkness is super important for um, the contrast and to really emulate this time of day, uh, sunrise or sunset. And we're going to see a dark like this appear in the trees themselves. Trying to just like soften this up some. Let everything start working together. Now, I'm going to take some raw sienna. And I told you about how some of those trees on the far sides had caught some light. And they're almost all raw sienna, um, or at least the lighter tree trunks. I feel like I need to put a tree mass on this side, even though this is absolutely going to be covered by the mat. I want that there. I want to work off the edge of the paper. And I can bring this tone as if I have vines and whatnot growing up these guys. I could add more to them. And we might take other colors in a bit for that. Add some textural movement. Okay, now we're back to the hake. Let's go raw sienna. But I want it dry. This is catching the sunlight, the outside edge. Catching the sunlight. Sun sunlight shining right through this. Sunlight shining right through. So I'm looking more at the edges of these guys for this tone. Build up of brush. Um, now I'm going to get a little bit of um, the light red or burnt sienna, either one should work for this. Let's make sure this is dry enough. Add some reds. In fact, I could do quite a stout little bush right in here. Make an interesting red. Let him come up back here on the side. Now we're just being very gentle with the hake. Well, I mean, this is not a gentle application, but we're just um, kind of feeling it out, seeing how everything's going to be put together. And I don't think I'm going to pull out um, a fan brush. A 
feel like we're getting great light trees. Unfortunately, we're going to have to darken the middles uh, for contrast. You can grab some of this to put along the edge of this guy. Grab some of these reds right here. Okay, let's get dark. Ultramarine. Sorry, um, yeah, Ultramarine Burnt Umber. Now this isn't super dark because I'm trying to go with this soft pattern, but I'm going to definitely lighten up and con uh, darken up and concentrate these inside and outside areas. I'm gonna let that rest for a moment because I'm liking this direction I'm going in, but I need to take a step back, not get too excited. Let's take a moment to put in some branches. This guy's off the page. I also think off the page elements coming into a painting helps give an idea of a broader expanse as well. That was another thing that I had saw on both sides of this painting where he continued off the edges of both sides. So that kind of goes back to what I've been talking about painting through and following through. Paints Gray, Ultramarine. Trying to get that weepy feeling. down here. Use the side to dry brush and add. Darken up this trunk. Let me do a dry off. Then I'm gonna put a dark in to the inside of these guys and see what happens. I'm putting this here because that opening does look a little weird for me. All right.
here's the dark and I had to do the dry off in order to maintain the integrity of um, these foliage shapes otherwise everything would have um, wet and wet uh, fed into each other Darker, dark. I'm trying to maintain standard palette for y'all that will probably, if you follow along, I could rely on phthalo blue, but I'm not not going to use that for the darks. This is this guy off the page. we can add. off <laughs> just to show you this is like must be the first time I'm washing the brush this painting let's get that soft raw sienna and build up some of these spots in the water just to activate it like sometimes at that point I'll dip just that little bit right there just to get a little bit of water the Venetian red or like I said light red that you can use Over that in the water. 
with the rigger. Nothing needs to be super dark at this point because we're doing thinner branches. And more towards the top, catching more light. dark texture in here. Let's use a dark mix. This will probably be like the last layer of the foliage. I think you could continue working on it and playing around and seeing where you can go with it. But I think I'm ready to stop it at this point. Um, let's see, I want to vary up this edge, I feel like it's too straight. So you know what we could really do? We'll use, um, we'll dry this off. We do have to add I have the razor blade out now and let's say our light source is coming from here let's see if we pull out white white comes down catches a little bit of light there catches the water back here Somebody in the chat says hello. Hi. I'm going to take the rigger. And oh, have an alarm set. Okay. I'm going to take the razor blade and I'm not going to do this pointed scraping that I just did here. I am now going to do the cutting motion for a straight. See if these ones are showing through at all. A 
and that's to get kind of lighter effects in those spots. It's not much of a difference, but I think it is a little interesting variation. You can pick little white flowers as well. Lighten up some of these spots. I do want to do one more foliage. I'm sorry that saying that I was not going to do it at that point. Let's try it off and I think we'll sign it. We'll call it at that. So one last look over, like I said, we'll sign it, we'll put a mat over it, see how it looks. Um, felt like I got a little off center with these. I was thinking about that white line back here on that whole edge. This is just experimental back here to see if we like it or not. Could have used a magic eraser or lift it or just put masking fluid right there. I think the wet and wet paid off with those background softness on those hills. If you remember that shadow we put in right here for this mountain mass, kind of um a little difficult to discern what it is, but I think that adds to the overall um, atmospheric effect of this painting. And I think I think we learned a lot from this one. So, like I said, this was um, from my study of. Uh, like I said, three part name, so it's always hard. Jasper Francis Cropsey. So this was um, looking at the broad expanses that he had. Um, a sky that was a little bit darker in the top corners. And I think that was kind of a framing rounding effect. A lit background, how that affects the outside of the foliages. Um, so we use the raw sienna there. Um, thinner trunks. So it still feels like we're very close to this line, so that's something I want to work on. Um, there's also, we do get the idea of the expansion back here, and that we're part of big something. 
but I do want to maybe in the future these might need to be minimized in size and um, maybe that'll give a bigger feel to it. So we need to find a pen to sign it. And I just so happen to have a pen right here. Sign it right here. Oh, and oh, I haven't given the spiel. <clears throat> if you like what you watch, please, you know, like, subscribe, comment. If you have any questions, I'll try to address them. I think I answer all of them that get posted. So if you ever have any questions or something you want me to address in a video, feel free to ask. And um, I'll do my best. Um, we also, okay, also I have a Patreon link below if you'd like to sign up for that. Uh, super cheap. It just helps with supplies and whatnot as, um, you know, paper and paint and stuff is expensive. I also have an Etsy account where if there's anything that I ever paint that you are interested in, I usually post them up there. Um, check out the Instagram. Check out my Facebook page for painting. I also have my oils and drawings up there and whatnot. Anyway, here's the finished results. Uh, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll talk to you all soon.